Founded in 1991 by brothers Ronald Slim Williams and Brian Baby Williams, Cash Money Records is the biggest record label coming out of the city of New Orleans, taking over the streets on its way to success with the majors. In its early years, Cash Money Records will release albums by UNLV, Tech 9 Juvenile, BG, Lil Slim, Pimp Daddy, Kilo G, Victor Ivan, The Hot Boys, just to name a few. Distributed by Republic Records, formerly known as Universal Republic, Cash Money will be home to a roster of mostly all hip-hop artists. In its later years, Lil Wayne, Drake, and Nicki Minaj will go on to be CMR's biggest selling solo artists. Cash Money will go on to become one of the biggest labels in the music industry today. Founded by Master P, No Limit Records will be distributed by Priority, Universal, and Koch Records. The label included artists such as Snoop Dogg, Mercedes, Silk the Shocker, Mystical, Mia X, Mac, Magic, Romeo Miller, Fiend, Kane and Abel, and Soldier Slim, just to name a few. Anthony Boswell, head of Body Body Management, will serve as Vice President of Operations as well as Head of Management for the label. In the late 90s, No Limit Records would have mainstream success with releases such as Masterpiece, Hell D, Trues, True to the Game, and Snoop Dogg, The Game is to be sold not told. Known for quickly producing lengthy albums consisting of up to 20 tracks, No Limit would drop albums faster than Evict spending his whole check on the first. Contrary to popular belief, the CMR No Limit beat would not stem from music. Baby's family, originally from Saratoga, but later moved to the 13th Ward. It was there that Baby would be raised. Losing his mom at a young age, Baby's inspiration would be his pops, Mr. Johnny, who is a military vet that owned and operated his own businesses. One of those businesses would be Gladys Bar. It wouldn't be long before Baby would jump in the game and start hustling. After getting popped twice, Baby would learn from his mistakes and move smarter. Baby would move work throughout the entire uptown area, specifically Tanoya, where he had gotten a hood pass from KC. The Hot Boys, a group of notorious street figures, would be active at the time. That group would consist of Gangsta, Sterling, Dooney, and Rookie. AKA Mosquito. If you know, you know. Percy Miller, AKA Master P, would hail from the Calio Projects, AKA the CP3. P would earn his bones by flipping a $10,000 settlement from the passing of his grandfather to open a record store in Richmond, California. It was there that P would get his first break in the music industry, later bringing his success back to the NO, where he would recruit a whole new roster. This roster would mainly consist of artists that KLC of Parkway Pumping Records had already been working with. Not as deep in the game as Baby, P would state in interviews that as a youth, he was one of parts of the infamous street crew, the Tuesday Crew, which consisted of names such as Bruce, Burnell, Klukey, Kevin, and Jen, just to name a few. Kevin Miller would later lose his life to the streets at a young age. It's the early 90s, the streets are popping. The Yo, known for that 11-5, would be home to some of the most notorious street figures to ever run the streets of the N.O. Dodo, Levi, Jojo, Meatball, Randall, Tom Scully, Glenn Metz, Turbo, just to name a few. The Yo and the Noya at one time would rock with each other, creating beeps, crushing each other's ops. P, who had gotten his money up by this time, would be highly respected in the Cali Yo. It was rumored that P had laced the BTGs, aka Back of Town Gangsters, with new Dodge and Trepid. P's brother C, aka CD, was known for showing love to the Yo, even having an apartment in the project while running with the Cut Boys. Let's rewind. The game comes with snitches, rats, informants, cutthroaters, nappers, hitters, Jackers and D Boys. The relationship between the Yo and the Noya will soon take a turn. An FBI informant would allegedly work with the feds to try and take down Sam Scully's operation, the notorious Clay Game. The bag would be put on his head. One of the young hitters of the Yo would take the hit for the 20 racks. He would catch dude slipping but wasn't able to crush him. Either the gun jammed or the magazine would fall out of the gap. Needless to say, he didn't get the job done. The next day, he would get caught with the gap and be arrested. He would allegedly be bonded out by an unknown source. The dudes out the yo will believe it to be the Noya. This has never been proven or confirmed. Allegedly, after bonding out, he would go on an apparent hit with three men. This hit would be a setup. He would be crushed and dumped in the 12th Ward. After watching the news, the yo would learn that the body found in the 12th Ward would be him. The yo would now be out for blood. The streets were saying dudes at the Noya were running with homeboy who had the bag on his head. It was this affiliation that would cause the yo to believe that the hot boys went with the move on dude. Let's move on. The plot thickens. Hot boy Stealing will lose his life from a beef in the streets. He will be deleted in the Iberville projects. Terrence Mr. Williams will be with Sterling when he was hit up. Mosquito, another member of the hot boys, will be caught with a pistol at Sterling's funeral. He will be locked up and convicted on a charge. The criminal justice system would make 
make a huge mistake. Mosquito, who was sent to court for a traffic violation, will be set free despite being convicted for the blicky. Now on the run, Rookie could no longer move how he wanted to move. He could no longer hang on the same sets or leave his head where he wanted to. Having ties in the yo, Skeeto would decide to make the Calio his duck off. This would turn out to be a horrible mistake as he would be crushed in the yo. The beef would intensify as both sides were now out for blood. The city would run rampant with rumors. Gangster would be accused of crushing Randall and P's cousin Hot Boy. No truth to this has ever been confirmed. Baby, who would have strong ties to the Noya, would have to make a decision. That decision would be to not rock with P or the No Limit camp. He will be quoted in interviews the saying, if I don't rock with you, nobody from my camp can rock with you. Mr. Marcello, who was at the Noya, would have part ownership as well as being an artist on Tough Guy Records, a label formed by Dodo out the yo. They will both be on some get money shit. Marcello and Dodo will be more interested in getting money and being involved in street beef. Going on to record a music video and both projects. Meanwhile, CMR will be heating the streets up with the hot boys, PG and Juvenile. The U by this time was off the label. P would be having major mainstream success at the time, but not without controversy. Before leaving the label, the U and CMR would accuse P of stealing the term bout it, which was one of the U's classic hits. This wouldn't be the only thing that P would be accused of stealing. CMR would also accuse P of attempting to steal the term Hot Boys before Cash Money could present the group nationwide. P would go on to mock CMR. He would be quoted in interviews as saying, Them boys are local. I'm nationwide. Cash Money artists would take slight digs at No Limit in their music. Their beef would go on to forever be a part of New Orleans history. This was the story of the Cash Money No Limit beef. PG is a solo artist, plus he's a member of the Hot Boys. Turk is a part of the Hot Boys. Lil Wayne is a part of the Hot Boys, which will be doing his solo album. And I know y'all all know Juvenile, who is a solo artist, and he's a Hot Boy. You got me and my dog, Fresh. He do all beat, game spitting, however you want to label it, nickname it how you want it. Sugar Slim called All Shots, and I'm the number one stunt. Lil Wayne will begin his career as a preteen delivering hardcore southern hip-hop. Through years of maturation and prolific output, during which the delivery of his humorous wordplay and rhyme gradually changed from childlike and witty to stoned and raspy. Wayne would develop into a multi-million unit selling artist with a massive body of work, one so inventive and cunning that it makes his claim of being the best rapper alive worth considering by many. Wayne would debut at the age of 11 and receive his first platinum certification five years later as a member of the Hot Boys, immediately thereafter becoming a formidable solo artist with the release of The Block Is Hot in 1999. This would be his first of 12 top 10 albums on the Billboard 200 during a period of constant output entailing not just successful lengths but also reputation building mixtapes and featured appearances on pop hits like Destiny Child, Soldier. Wayne would reach mainstream superstar status with the release of The Card 3 in 2008, a triple platinum blockbuster that would produce the number one pop hit, Lollipop, and the number six follow-up, Emily. The Carter 3 would net Wayne three Grammy Awards, including Best Rap Album, throughout the 2010s, despite numerous legal and creative battles. Wayne would continue to be a regular presence on the upper reaches of the charts with albums such as The Carter 4 that were released in 2011 and I'm Not a Human Being that were released in 2013, solidifying his status as a tour headliner all while continually lengthening his list of collaborative hits including the multi-platinum Sucker for Pain off the Suicide soundtrack in 2016 and the DJ Khaled Smash hit released in 2017. Wayne would top the Billboard 200 with consecutive LPs to Carter 5 in 2018 and Funeral in 2020. Weezy would continue to issue non-album singles and mixtape like his 2021 Rich the Kid collaboration, Trust One Babies, and 2023 Nobody featuring DMX. Born September 27, 1982, to Mesita, the Wayne Michael Carter Jr. will be raised in the infamous New Orleans neighborhoods to the 17th Ward, Holly Grove, and the New Orleans East. Throughout his school years, Lil Wayne would be a straight-A student. Two of the schools that he would attend would be Abe and McMahon. 
Wayne never felt his true intelligence was expressed through any kind of report card. He would find music was the best way to express himself, earning him the nickname Tunes from his stepfather, Rabbit, who would sadly lose his life to the streets. After taking the name Gangsta D, he will begin writing Gangsta Rhyme. Combining a strong work ethic with aggressive self-promotion, at 11 years old, Wayne will convince Baby of Cash Money Records to sign him to the label. Sita, who was reluctant at first, would eventually allow Wayne to sign. A year later, Wayne and BG will partner with Manny Fresh and be dubbed the BGs and release the album True Stories. BG will go on to release Chopper City. In 1997, Wayne will be rumored to have accidentally shot himself in the chest. Wayne would later reveal in interviews and in his music that it wasn't an accident at all. He had actually tried to take his own life. The same year of the Chopper City release, Weezy will officially run with the moniker Lil Wayne. Wayne will go on to state that he dropped the D from his first name in order to separate himself from his father who had never been in his life. Wayne would join fellow label mates BG, the juvenile, and Turk to form the Hot Boys, who would release their debut album, Get It How You Live, in 1997. In 1998, Cash Money was signed a major distribution deal with Universal Records. With major mainstream distribution, the Hot Boys' Gorilla Warfare album will reach the number one spot on Billboard's top R&B hip-hop albums chart list. In 1998, Lil Wayne was featured on Juvenile's hit single, Back That Thing Up, that would appear on Juvie's 400 Degrees album. Wayne would launch his solo career a year later with the album The Block Is Hot, featuring the hit single The Block Is Hot. The album would go double platinum. Wayne still had not reached middle America as his hardcore rhymes and tough cash money sound had not yet crossed over. Wayne's second album, Lights Out, in 2000 will fail to match the success of The Block Is Hot. Lights Out will go gold. Wheezy will go on to feature on the big timers hit single, Number One Stunner. Wayne's audience will be rapidly growing. While Wayne will credit Fresh for being primarily responsible for launching his music career, Wheezy will be much closer to Brian Williams, a.k.a. Baby. When Juvie left the label, Wayne will show his loyalty to Baby by releasing 500 Degrees 2002, which will go gold. Rumors will begin to fly about Cash Money's financial troubles and possible demise. The rest of the Hot Boys had left. Wayne's planned 2003 album would be scrapped. It would instead be released as an underground mixtape called The Drought. Wayne would begin to singly handle and take over the mixtape world after The Drought had drawn so much attention from the hip-hop press. Weezy used these underground releases to build anticipation for his next official album, The Carter, that would release in 2004. The single, Go DJ, would reach number five on the hip-hop singles chart. Wayne would go on to feature on Destiny Child single, Soldier. Wayne had officially crossed over. Wayne would continue to feed the streets with a slew of mixtapes released in 2005. Dedication with DJ Drama and the suffix with DJ Khaled. Cash Money's future was no longer in doubt, and traditional music business rules no longer seem to apply. Wayne's tracks will be leaked onto the internet in various DJ mixtapes. Get something with another bold move, as a Universal Fund video was made without the track ever seeing the light of day. With his alternative marketing scheme, working in overdrive, the 2005 release of the Carter 2 will be a major event, selling over a quarter million copies the week of its release. Fireman and Shooter with Robin Thicke will be released as singles. This album, for the first time, would have no production from Manny Fresh. The album will go platinum. Just from Wheezy, future Young Money label would appear on the album. The following year, Wayne the Baby will release Father Like Sunny album, which will feature the hit single, Stuntin' Like My Daddy. With his mixtape still flooding the underground, including Dedication 2, Wayne was bubbling. With no official follow-up to the Carter 2 in sight, numerous collaborative tracks will keep Wheezy in the mainstream like Gimme That by Chris Brown, Make It Rain by Fat Joe, and Duffel Bag Boys by Player Circle, all three becoming big hits. The Carter 3 that was slated for 2007 wouldn't drop until a year later. The Carter 3 would drop in May of 2008, selling more than a million copies in the first week. With an appearance on Saturday Night Live and a handful of Grammys, Wayne's mainstream acceptance would be undeniable. Wayne would go on to perform at the Country Music Awards 
for Kid Rock, where he would play the guitar. The guitar playing would be part of Wayne's new involvement with rock music, including his help in signing Kevin Rudolph to Cash Money Records, plus an appearance on Rudolph's massive hit, Let It Rock. Wayne will release his Young Money mixtape. Young Money is the Army, better yet, the Navy. The official album, We Are Young Money, would drop that same year. Wayne's Rebirth album would drop in early 2010. Shortly after, Wayne would be sentenced to nine months for a criminal possession of his firearm. Wayne would do his jokes in PC on Rikers Island. Free at last. After serving eight months in prison, Grammy Award-winning rap star Lil Wayne has been released from New York's Rikers Island. He was sent there after a loaded firearm was found on his tour bus last year in Manhattan. But prison has not halted the career of this popular artist. Lil Wayne released a new album in September titled I Am Not a Human Being, which topped the Billboard charts at number one last month. And with his first day out of captivity, there's already plans to celebrate. Close friends will host a lavish homecoming celebration for him in Miami this weekend, and industry insiders are buzzing about what's next. MTV reports that he might soon perform along with fellow star Drake in Las Vegas. Ken Lombardi, CBSNews.com, New York. The Carter Four will finally drop in 2011. With the lead single, Six Foot Seven, the album will reach the top spot on the Billboard 200. In 2013, Wayne will be slammed with criticism for a controversial verse he spit on Future's Karate Shop, where he made a reference to Emmett Till, the young black teenager that was gruesome in 1955 by white men. Wayne will go on to release his second volume of I Am Not A Human Being. The album will debut at number two, featuring the singles No Worries and Love Me. A sequence of singles to make up for the delay, the Carter Five would ensue Believe Me, featuring Drake, in addition to Wayne's stockpile of certified platinum hits. Another track, Nothing But Trouble, featuring Charlie, would drop in 2015 as a contribution to the soundtrack for 808 The Movie. That same year, to make up for fan disappointment over the Carter Five delays, Wayne will release Sorry For The Wait. In 2016, Wayne will become enrolled in the legal battle with Birdman and Cash Money Records, further complicating the fate of the Carter Five. These continued delays will prompt the release of the Free Weezy album. By the end of the year, Wayne will publish a memoir about his time spent at Rikers Island, gone till November, and scored another hit with Sucker for Pain, a collaboration for the chart-topping Suicide soundtrack. The all-star track will top the Billboard rap charts and rise to number three on the R&B hip-hop charts. DJ Khaled will become one of Wayne's biggest collaborations the following year, topping the pop chart on his way to quintuple platinum. Wayne would finally drop the Carter Five after joining Blink 182 in 2019 for a co cool headline tour and mashup single with My Age that would feature a broad range of guests, J Rock, Lil Baby, and XX Extension. It would drop in January of 2020 and enter the Billboard 200 at the top. In July of the same year, Wayne would release his 2015 mixtape, The Free Weezy Album, as FWA. The project has seen an exclusive release only on one streaming service five years earlier. But the wider release will be different, with some tracks omitted completely and new mixes of songs that formerly included uncleared samples. 2021 will see the tracks BB King Freestyle featuring Drake and Funeral. Both will top the Billboard charts and the release Ain't Got Time. In October of that year, Wayne will team up with Rich the Kid for the 10 song mixtape Trust Fund Baby. The project included only one featured guest spot from YG. In January of 2022, Wayne's 2011 mixtape, Sorry for the Wait, would drop on streaming services for the first time. The newly refreshed version of the tape would include four songs recorded around the time of its re-release, including guest spots from Lil Tika and Alan Kubas. In February of 2023, Wayne would drop I Am Music. I Am Music would include some of Wayne's best known, best loved, and best performing songs from across his career. That album would debut at number 25 on the Billboard Top 200. Wayne had made it. His status in the music world had changed from rapper to rock star. All would be peaches and cream as Wayne's extracurricular activities would impact his health.
I'm James Vallis. Hip-hop artist Lil Wayne's private plane has made an emergency landing in Nebraska after he suffered a seizure and blacked out, according to reports, which say he has since regained consciousness and is refusing treatment. The incident happened on Monday afternoon when Wayne was flying in a private jet from Milwaukee in Wisconsin to California. It forced the aircraft to divert to Omaha in Nebraska, where it made an emergency landing. An ambulance responded to the scene and checked out Wayne, according to TMZ.com, which said Wayne had since regained consciousness and is refusing medical treatment. Other details were not immediately available. There was no immediate comment from authorities or Wayne's representatives. Stay with BNONews.com for the very latest and follow us on Twitter throughout the day for breaking news updates as it happens at BNO News. Rapper Lil Wayne was rushed to the hospital after he was found unconscious in Chicago. Reports say he suffered multiple seizures in a hotel room yesterday. The 34-year-old was forced to cancel his Las Vegas performance last night. Just last year, the rapper's private plane made an emergency landing after he suffered a seizure. Four years ago, Lil Wayne revealed he is epileptic and prone to seizures. In the Valley last night, a Grammy Award-winning rapper has been detained at a border checkpoint on possession of Mountain Action Force Rafael Carranza has the latest. That's right, Lacey. You heard about it here first on Action 4 News. Rapper Lil Wayne was detained at the Falfurias checkpoint earlier today, according to a Border Patrol supervisor. <laughs> These are YouTube images of Lil Wayne's concert at the Dodge Arena on Thursday. This afternoon, agents in Falfuri has detained 12 people, including the popular rapper, on board two tour buses. Uh, one of our U.S. Border Patrol canine teams alerted to the possible presence of people or narcotics on the bus. That led to a secondary inspection, at which time they found one, not on any one person, but in the bus. But they are not releasing how much. Thursday's concert was his first trip to the Valley. The amateur video posted on YouTube of last night's concert... <laughs> Shows him performing in front of a packed house. Lil Wayne is a rapper with Cash Money, Universal Motown Records. His real name is Dwayne Michael Carter Jr. He was scheduled to perform in Laredo tonight, but that event was postponed. Yeah, there was some fans uh, outside, uh, and we did make the announcement to them. Uh, you know, they were obviously disappointed, but uh, you know, we didn't have any incidents or anything like that. The general manager at the Laredo Entertainment Center, where he was scheduled to perform, tells Action 4 News they are working on setting up a new date. Lil Wayne has another scheduled performance in Corpus Christi on Sunday, but it is unclear if that concert has been postponed as well. Reporting in the newsroom, Rafael Carranza, Action 4 News. Now at 11, police have cleared the scene at a Miami Beach mansion. They raided the place this evening with a celebrity's prized possessions as their target. Rapper Lil Wayne owes someone a lot of money and he isn't paying, so police showed up to collect. CBS 4's Kerry Codd has more. Miami-Dade police descended on the Miami Beach mansion of rapper Lil Wayne Tuesday afternoon. According to police, they were serving a warrant in a civil case to seize property. We're told police forced their way into the rapper's home, valued at $10.3 million. TMZ is reporting that the police took items to satisfy a court judgment against Lil Wayne for $2 million. TMZ says the judgment is for money the rapper owes to a private jet company. What did police take? TMZ reports that authorities carted out some of Lil Wayne's pricey pieces of art and says he has about $30 million worth of art in his home. All the drama here didn't seem to bother this community too much. I spoke to a couple of neighbors off camera. They told me they've never had any problems with Little Wayne and that they have found him to be an excellent neighbor. This isn't the first time there's been police activity at Wayne's home. Back in March, the Miami Beach SWAT team was called to the house for a prank call of people being shot at the home. During Tuesday's police raid, we're told Wayne wasn't home at the time officers arrived. TMZ reports he's in Los Angeles. On Miami Beach, Kerry Codd, CBS 4 News Tonight. New at 5, trouble for rapper Lil Wayne. He was charged with possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. According to court documents, today's development stems from a trip to Miami on a private plane last December. That's when authorities say they found the weapon during a search of the jet. The rapper is expected in federal court next month and faces up to 10 years in prison if he's convicted. We're also just getting this. A few minutes ago here tonight, the Miami Herald is reporting federal agents have found guns and coke in a private plane that landed at Miami Opelika Executive Airport today. The paper reports 
Rapper Lil Wayne was on that plane, which brought him here, they say, from California. The report says charges could be filed soon in federal court. His lawyer tells the Herald his client was allowed to leave the airport tonight. The FBI and the ATF are handling the case. At 5.05 this morning, new from overnight in one of his last acts as President Donald Trump issued a long list of pardons and included on that list New Orleans native and rapper Lil Wayne, along with his former chief strategist Steve Bannon. Bannon was accused of defrauding millions of dollars in a fundraising campaign supposedly aimed at supporting President Trump's border wall. The president himself, along with members of his family, were not pardoned. He doesn't have to announce a pardon. It could be done mm. in private and stuck in his pocket, and we wouldn't know it until he was indicted and pulled it out for defense. Same with the, the kids. And the pardons were issued very early this morning, even earlier than this morning. This was the story of Lil Wayne, a.k.a. Wheezy F. Baby. Brian Christopher Williams, a.k.a. Brian Christopher Brooks, was born February the 15th, 1969, through Gladys Brooks and Johnny Williams. Brian would go by many names in the city. Baby, be Bubba, B32, be actress, and actress. Known globally in the entertainment world as Stunner, a.k.a. Birdman. Brian and his brother, Ronald Williams, are founders of Cash Money Records. Early artists to the label would be Kilo G, Miss T, Lil Slim, UNLV, Mr. Ivan, and Pim Daddy, just to name a few. With Manny Fresh on the beats, Tiamara would have the underground rap scene on lock. Cash Money's roster would change over the years, ultimately leading to a $30 million distribution deal with Universal Records. This is the story of Brian Baby Williams. Baby will be born Brian Christopher Brooks on February the 15th, 1969 at Charity Hospital in New Orleans, Louisiana to Johnny Williams and Gladys Brooks. Mr. Johnny not signing the birth certificate would lead to Brian initially taking his mother's last name. For nearly a month after his birth, Miss Gladys still had to give Brian a first name, earning him the nickname Baby. Brian would be the youngest of his siblings, Ronald and Kim. Mr. Johnny would have other kids outside of the three. Altogether, Brian would have 10 brothers and 12 sisters. Brian, Ronald, and Kim would spend their earlier years growing up in the third ward at 1233 South Saratoga Street on top of their family-owned business, Gladys Bar. Everyone knew everyone on Saratoga. It was a family-oriented neighborhood. Brian would never get a chance to meet his beloved grandmother. She would pass before he was born. Ronald, Kim, and Brian would come up with the Franken family sisters, Pam and Tammy, mother of the Chico, whose dad is Chico out the yo. If you know, you know. Johnny, who was a military vet of 19 years, would meet and marry Dorothy Williams at a young age. Dorothy would be 16 at the time. Johnny, who was the first sergeant, would be stationed in Germany for three years. Upon leaving Germany, Johnny would head to NY, where he would purchase a brand new Pontiac, which they would drive to Arkansas. From Arkansas to the N.O., where he would later purchase their first home. Johnny was a betting man and a hustler. One of his first hustles would be loan sharking, loaning a dollar on a quarter. For every dollar he would loan, he would receive a quarter interest. Mr. Johnny would get popped for loan sharking and be discharged from the military. Johnny would eventually find himself out of the military prison in Texas. Brian, the younger of the siblings, wouldn't be born until after the family had moved to the Saratoga neighborhood. Baby would be five years old when his mom, Miss Gladys, would pass. Kim would be eight, Ronald would be ten. Miss Gladys' brother would fly into town. Learning that Miss Gladys had passed upon his arrival, he would take it upon himself to drive the kids to Canada. The kids would not like Canada and would miss their dad. They would ultimately end up being driven back to the N.O. Without a legal guardian, they would be turned over to the state. Ronald and Brian would be admitted to a boy's home for two years, while Mr. Johnny would go back and forth to court. Upon proving he was a legal guardian, baby's last name would become Williams. After the passion of Miss Gladys, Johnny would meet Miss Pat in 1974. Eight months into the relationship, Johnny and Miss Pat would move in together. Baby will be spoiled at a young age. Unbeknownst to anyone, Johnny will be grooming Baby to understand money in the business. The Saratoga neighborhood would be rough. Johnny would end up being hit up during an attempted robbery. Johnny 
not one to let anybody take something from him, would tussle with the robber over the gun and get hit in the side. The robbers would end up getting deleted the very next week. It wouldn't be long before Johnny would move his family. The state would not allow Johnny to live above a bar with his young children, claiming it to be an endangerment to their lives. Johnny would purchase the biggest house on the block in the 13th on BL, 2615 Fallon Street. The Williams were living a good life. One Christmas, while the other kids were riding BMX, the Williams boys would be on mini bikes. Andrew Dunbar, a.k.a. Booty, Joe Casey Collins, a.k.a. Joe Casey and KC, who now goes by Shaheed Muhammad since converting to Islam, would be childhood friends of Baby. The Williams home would become the meeting place for Baby and his crew. They would all gather in the basement. This would be their sanctuary. Miss Pat would have a son from a previous relationship. His name was Eldrick. Known for having a spirited and humorous personality, Eldrick was also a ladies' man. Hearing himself the nickname LL Cool Eldrick, Ladies love Cool Eldrick, a play off the name of the rapper LL Cool J. Baby and his stepbrother Eldrick will be tighter than grip pliers. Baby, who was good at sports, would initially have dreams of being a professional sports player. Johnny would sponsor Baby's little league team that would win three championships back to back. Johnny would tailgate at these games, placing bets as well as selling food and beer. Those sports dreams would, however, soon turn into street dreams. It wouldn't be long before Baby would start hustling. As an early teen, Baby would be solidified in the streets, known for having bikes and buku whips. Damn near all that boy whips would have candy paint and white interior. In their adolescent years, Williams would attend Holy Ghost Catholic School on Harmony in Saratoga. They would attend several other schools in the city, Green and Carter G. Woodson. In his teen years, Baby would attend the Mac and LC Forche. After being kicked off the team at the foe, Baby would dive heavily into the game. Baby would pump out of a trap house for about two years. The trap house would have a metal gate with bars surrounding every window and door. Vicks would cop that hard from the mailbox slot on the front door. It wouldn't be long before Baby would sew up the 13th with that work. From there, he would move his operation to the Noya and the rest of the U. P.T. Even making moves downtown. The trap house would get kicked in. Baby would be arrested. At the age of 19, Baby would get popped after coming out of the Thomas, copping that work and catch a joke. It was rumored that one of the dudes at the Thomas put them people on him. Baby would do 18 months on a three year bid. With the game comes Jack Boys and Napper. Baby would narrowly escape his demise when he and Joe Casey were Jack downtown. Doing that 18 month jokes had given Baby an entirely different mindset. Baby would be wiser on the streets and move differently. The jokes didn't retire him from the game. He would continue to pump, but on a different level, moving them birds and making smarter, calculated moves in the streets. Eldrick's baby stepbrother was sad to lose his life to the streets on June 13th of 1991. He had been found face down in another neighborhood on a woman's front porch. After not hearing from Eldrick, Miss Pat would inform the NOPD. Not being 24 hours at the time, the NOPD would claim they were unable to find a missing persons report. They would advise Miss Pat to check the city morgue. It would be confirmed that Eldrick had been deleted. The loss of Eldrick would devastate baby. He would be on some F the world type ish after the passing of Eldrick. Fed up with the streets and looking for a way out, Baby and Slim would put their heads together and in 1991 launch Cash Money Records. Baby vowed never to look back and would eventually retire from the game. Years later, tragedy would strike. Mr. Johnny would be involved in a horrible car accident and be pronounced brain dead. Mr. Johnny would be taken off life support July 13th of 1996. Mr. Johnny would not get to see his boys explode onto the mainstream music scene. Cash Money would go on to sign a three-year, $30 million distribution deal with Universal Records in March of 1998, under which they would be given a $2 million advance each year and a credit of $1.5 million for each of the six artists they had at the time. After recouping, Universal Records will retain 15% of the profits from album sale, while Cash Money retained 85%, as well as 50% of their publishing royalties and ownership of all master recordings.
In 2007, Baby would again find himself in trouble with the law. He would be among 16 arrested on Interstate 81 after a Kingsport police corporal would pull over the driver of the RV rented from Entertainment Coaches of America in Leesburg, Florida, for allegedly making an improper lane change. ABD Corporal Tim Horn would conduct a traffic stop on the driver, Keith Boswell, 38, of Daytona Beach, Florida. After Boswell forced the trailer into an emergency lane to avoid being struck as he attempted to change lanes, the driver would inform the KBD officer that they were headed from New Orleans to New York for a BET shoot. The officer would inquire about the smell of that green coming from inside the RV. This would trigger the officer to call in a search warrant. Upon searching the RV, one pound of green would be found in the trash can of the RV's kitchenette. Ryan Williams, Brittany Williams, Ronald Williams would each be charged with possession of that perp along with 13 others, several of whom were affiliated with Cash Money Records. The third person off the bus, Brandon Thurston, would be strapped with a 9 double N tucked in his waistband. The ATF would put on the case after the discovery of a 223 carbine. No weapon charges would be filed at the time. Road manager Shahi Muhammad, aka KC, Cash Money Records promoter Casey Collins, and music promoter Anton would be among the remaining 13 arrested during Tuesday afternoon traffic stop that stalled traffic for over an hour and a half on I-81 near exit 59. Dion Crawford, Troy Collins, Michael Gray, Carl Bryant, George Betty, Norman Cobbins, and Jermaine Prien would all be charged with the green. They would all somehow be allegedly employed as either a rapper or something else with cash money records. The RV was moved to a secure location. Police would conduct a more thorough search of the RV to determine if there were more drugs or weapons would be found. Nothing else would be found on the RV. In 2012, Baby would find himself the center of attention for an incident that he had nothing to do with. Accuser Nicole Rushmoreland would bring charges against a member of CMR's entourage and falsely accuse Baby of having knowledge of the incident. Baby would be cleared on any and all accusations. Well, a College Park woman is asking a judge to make a record company responsible for an assault committed by one of its employees. Now, the woman claims she was supposed to be given an opportunity to make a business presentation, but instead she says she was, quote, exposed to drugs and ex activity before the act took place. And Fox 5's Morse Diggs is here now with both sides of a legal battle. Morse. A man of the record company is a giant in the rap music industry. Cash Money Records. Their attorney told me the owners deny the claims in the civil lawsuit, and he vows the young woman's story won't hold up before a jury. This College Park woman says her attempt to conduct business with a recording company ended badly, very badly. I was followed to the bathroom, forced inside. And Nicole Westmoreland identified Alfred Cleveland as the man who committed. He told authorities when they took him into custody that he worked for Cash Money Records. The criminal case has already been handled through a negotiated plea. Cleveland got jail time. Attorney Charles Hodges, on behalf of the young woman, has a civil lawsuit pending against the record company. How big is cash money? The label's artists include Lil Wayne, Nicki Minaj, and others considered top-shelf talent. Atlanta is red hot right now for music. Even out-of-town firms like Cash Money will lease studio space to do business here. The company did just that at this building in northwest Atlanta. And that is where Westmoreland claims Brian Williams, a co-owner of Cash Money, invited her to come for a presentation. Williams was not involved in any way. I was invited by uh, members of Cash Money to, uh, for a presentation. Um, I was hesitant at first to uh, go to the studio, but I was assured that I would be safe. Once inside, Westmoreland says instead of seeing a business client, she saw something much different. There were drugs and um, activity going on. In the lobby? In the lobby. Feeling uncomfortable, Westmoreland says she retreated to the ladies' room to weigh her next move. That's when she says Cleveland took advantage and followed her inside. As a result of trusting these individuals, she experienced the most dramatic event a woman could go through. And certainly there should be some liability on the part of those who invited her to that premise. Cash Money Records has retained Clarksville lawyer James Cox to handle the civil complaint. Uh, your uh, employer is not liable for the criminal acts of employees unless they should have foreseen those acts were going to occur. Cox claims Miss Westmoreland's account of what happened that evening is full of holes. When Cox answers the charges, he will tell Fulton County jurors that cash records owner Brian Williams does not recall having any kind of business conversation with the young woman. Besides, he'll say Westmoreland went to the studio late at night. And who makes an introductory call late at night? He says that Westmoreland was there just hanging out 
and brought some female friends along. Westmoreland concedes only that looking back, she was in the wrong place. I felt like I'd made a, a very, very bad decision to go in the first place, and uh, I was scared. The way I feel then is the way I still feel now. Um, I feel like I've lost a part of myself that I will never get back. Now, Cash Money says the notion that the young lady was lured to the Lee studio to be attacked is ridiculous. And Cox says Cash Money absolutely did not allow its lobby to be filled with people doing this and having a... Mandon Russ. All right. Now, we know in civil cases, the burden of proof isn't as strong as in criminal cases. Mm -hmm. What kind of chance does she have? Do we know? Well, it's going to come down to her credibility as well as Mr. Williams. What kind of representations did he make to her? I'll tell you what the defense attorney is concerned about, though the overall image of the rap music industry overall, the genre. He's concerned that if, if the jurors uh, look at the overall industry and not the facts in this case, he could be in trouble. All right. Morse, mm -hmm. thank you. Since then, CMR has gone on to become the biggest and longest lasting rap label in the industry. Nineteen ninety one will be the year of the bounce music explosion in New Orleans, ignited by acts such as TT Tucker and DJ Earth. Over the next few years, several independent labels will quickly begin to grow on the scene. Brian Baby Williams and Ronald Sugar Slim Williams would launch their own label, Cash Money Records. Kilo G will be one of the first artists on CMR. His debut album would be The Sleepwalker, which was produced by Roe and Goldfingers. Take Four, another label at the time, will be releasing music as well. CMR will rely on local distributors like Gonzalez Music and Southwest Distribution. It is rumored that Ziggy will put them in the game with Manny Fresh. Fresh, who will produce Releases for other local labels will become Cash Money's in-house producer. With Fresh on the tracks, CMR will sell somewhere near 23 million records. Fresh's first effort on the label will be PMW. PMW, who initially went by Big Man, was out of Ville. The debut album, Legalized Past the Green, will be released in 93, featuring Lil Slim, UNLV, Mr. Ivan, and Bun B. This release will come after UNLV's Six and Barone. The uptown-based UNLV was initially Reginald Tech 9 Manual and Yafet Lil Yah Jones, who formed in 1992 and will rock block parties, clubs, and gong shows. It wouldn't be long before Lil Slim, The Game is Cold, will be released. The U would add one more member, Albert Yellowboy Thomas. With Manny Fresh Fire Tracks, the U will be recognized recreating the sound which is now known today as gangster bounce music. The Slim of the Grove represent Apple and Eagle. Baby, who would go by B32, will release his own music, D the Bag of D. The Slim will rock bars in the city, such as Fort Nine. The Game is Cold would also feature Pimp Daddy, a local bounce rapper of the Nine. Pimp will go on to release his debut album, Still Pimpin', in 1994. Rumors will circulate that Pimp was dating Miss T and had a baby by Cheeky Black. Not long after that, Pimp would be deleted. UNLV's second album, Straight Out the Gutter, would be another banger. Mr. Ivan, 187, and the Hockey Mask will go on to sell 60,000 units. Unbeknownst to many, Lil Yacht deserves credit for the huge success of CMR. Yacht would act almost as an a &R, bringing new unsigned talent to the label. Lil Slim's Powder Shop would move away from Bounce. The sound would be more that of gangster rap. On Lil Slim's Thuggin' and Pluggin', Manny Fresh's production would be made more conscious to West Coast style rappers. UNLV's Mac Melf Calio will be another banger and a hood classic. It will go on to sell 80,000 copies. Tech 9 straight from the rap will be an underrated cult classic. Cash Money will begin to purge his roster and invest in new younger talent. Two of those investments would be 13-year-old Lil Doobie, Christopher B.G. Dorsey, and 11-year-old Lil Wayne. The two will be credited as a duo on the Bee Gees, The True Story album, which will feature them both. UNLV's Uptown for Life will be described as the best body of work. Again, teaming up with Manny, they would drop the hit single, Drag Em In The River. Uptown for Life will go on to sell 200,000 copies. BG will release the classic Chopper City, which will sell 25,000 copies out the gate. CMR will re-release Pimp's album in 96. Miss T will drop her album, Female Baller, the same year. Yah, as mentioned earlier, will put Juvie in the game with Baby. Juvie will sign and soon after drop Soldier Rags. The album will go on to sell 200,000 copies. BG, It's All On You, Volume 1 and 2 will be released in four short months. 
both are still today hood classics. Ciamara, with a suggestion from Terrence Gangs and Williams, would launch the Hot Boys. The group would consist of BG, Wayne, Juvie, and Turk. The group would release Get It How You Live, which will go on to sell 75,000 units. Baby and Fresh would later form the Big Timers, dropping How You Love That. June 18th of 1998, CMR will go nationwide. The rest would be history. This was the story of Brian Birdman Williams. Let's just say Birdman, Lil Wayne beef and they split. Do you go Birdman or Lil Wayne? Okay, what was it like after you got them their deal and they didn't want to pay you? It was frustrating. I mean, you know, the, the thing about cash money is that, you know, in order to get paid, you have to sue them. Tell B yeah. about one with your money. The Carter Five would drop in September of 2018 and rock the hip hop world with the Swiss Beast produced uproar. The Carter Five would take Falsetto Kenny near the top of the Hot 100 with Mona Lisa and bring Never Your Back with Dope New Gospel. The Carter Five isn't complete, just talking about the hits. The project would suffer four years of delays and dissolve one of hip hop's tightest bonds. Wayne was just nine years old when he met the man he would call his pa, Brian. Birdman Williams. There's no secret as to what would happen next. Juvenile's Cash Money's records taking over for the 9-9 in the 2000s was a legit prophecy. The label will become one of the most dominant of the 21st century. Lil Wayne will become hip-hop's most prolific superstar. Before the signing of the following decade's biggest superstars, Drake and Nicki Minaj, Lil Wayne and Birdman's commercial peak would come in 2008 with the Carter 3. C3 would likely be the last hip-hop album to earn over 1 million in pure album sales in its first week. It was that unmixed success and their openly La Familia-like bond that would make their very public falling out over the delay of the quarter five so disheartening to fans. January 13th of 2015, Lil Wayne would announce a $51 million lawsuit against Cash Money. The following three years would include Wayne's bus getting hit up, Wayne stopping mid-concert to yell F Cash Money. I just want to turn y'all up for a second. You already know what it is. Free Weezy album coming soon. Carter 5 coming soon. Fuck cash money. Fake public hugs and desperate tweets from Wayne hitting at retirement. Let's take a look back at Lil Wayne's beat with Birdman and Cash Money Records. This is the story of the Birdman versus Lil Wayne $51 million beef. The first cracks in the armor would appear after Lil Wayne would express his frustration with his longtime label, Cash Money Record, via Twitter. The Carter Five was slated to drop on December 9th. Wayne would claim Birdman forced him to delay the project. Wayne would tweet, I want off this label and nothing to do with these people. Unfortunately, it ain't that easy. I'm a prisoner and so is my creativity. Despite the harsh word from Wayne, the day prior, Cortez Bryant would report to TMZ that there was no beef, everything was good between Birdman and Wayne. But regardless of what Cortez has reported, Wayne would sound very unhappy with his label situation. At Vice's 20th anniversary party in Brooklyn, Wayne would be one of the many musical guests. Weezy would yell to the crowd that he's effed up in a bad situation, but he will be out of it soon. Mac Main would sit down with Miami's 99 Jams to discuss the label drama. He would state that the Carter Five will be coming out in the first quarter of 2015. He would also give his thoughts on the fight. He would go on to say, I wouldn't pinpoint anyone personally. That's my uncle and my brother that you're talking about. I keep a positive vibe about everything. Further stating that it was just some business that needed to be handled. Once that's handled, they will keep it moving. Everybody has their breaking point. I support Wayne 1000%. I feel like this matter will get resolved. Period. If I'm still around, it will be resolved. With tensions coming to a head, Cortez Bryant would post a lengthy message to Instagram, slamming Cash Money Records and arguing that Wayne had put the label on his back for a very long time. Cortez would write Wayne carry Cash Money on his back for over 10 years when he could have left and did his own thing. Wayne's the most loyal person I know on earth. He doesn't deserve this ish. He's gone through it at this point in the game. Lil Wayne built young money from his dreams to reality, launched the careers of Drake, Nicki Minaj, and Tiger, not from their talent, but from the belief 
he had in them. January 25th of 2015, Wayne will file a $51 million lawsuit against Cash Money. The lawsuit would claim that Birdman was violating the terms of his contract by withholding the Carter Five. The lawsuit will seek to end his contract with Cash Money and take all of his young money signings with him. Most notably, Drake and Nicki Minaj. Although reluctant to discuss his legal issues, Wayne would tell Rolling Stone magazine that he's not on speaking terms with Birdman. He would also give an update on the Carter Five, saying it is super done. Cake bake, icing on top, name on top, candles lit. I would have released it today if I could, but it's a dead subject right now. It's a jewel in the safe. It's that stash house money. March 14 of 2015, Lil Wayne would diss Birdman and Young Money's up next cipher. Rapping, Young, MF and Money. These my MF and brothers, not my F and hubbies. And saying it, hit him up to my daddy. On April 2nd of 2015, Wayne would yell F cash money while on stage in Jacksonville, Florida. In April of 2015, social media outlets will report that Wayne is dropping his lawsuit against cash money. This wouldn't be the case. Wayne had only moved the suit to New Orleans from his original filing in New York City. The claims previously filed by Lil Wayne and Young Money LLC against cash money from substantial monies owed and breach of contract had not been settled and would be prosecuted in Louisiana as well. April 26 of 2015, Lil Wayne's tour bus would be hit up in Atlanta. The bus would be hit up as it was pulling away from a performance at the Compound Nightclub in Atlanta. Wayne and his young money artist Lil Twist were on board. No one was injured. Atlanta police were not immediately able to identify a suspect. Wayne would again discash money on ASAP Rocky's miss. May 29th of 2015, Young Thug affiliate Pee Wee Roscoe will be arrested for busing at Lil Wayne's tour bus. Jimmy Winfrey, aka Pee Wee Roscoe, will be apprehended in connection with hitting up Lil Wayne's bus in Atlanta. The Wayne and Birdman beef was concerning to fans at first. This would bring things to another level. Wayne would be embroiled in an on again, off again beef with rapper Young Thug. Thugger would get backlash for trying to name his project The Carter Six. Thug would claim that it was simply in homage to his idol, Lil Wayne. The Thug-Roscoe connection would draw much suspicion. Roscoe had recently appeared in Thugger's halftime video, Clutching a Chopper. The indictment would claim that Roscoe had carried out Thug's threats of violence towards Wheezy. In June of 2015, Wayne was signed with Global Royalties company Kobo Neighboring Rights. The company helps artists pursue their royalty payments around the globe. Kobo's powerful tracking system compares collections against detailed in-house expectations to ensure all income is correctly accounted for. Kobo develops these detailed expectations from third-party performance data, territory expectations from Kobo's P-Distribution Health Check, as well as from the client's income data. Combining these three data sources, allows them to monitor collection and ensures all income is received. January 14th of 2015, Lil Wayne was signed a streaming deal with Tidal. Weezy would announce on stage that he had signed a deal with his MF and Idol, Jay-Z. Rumors would circulate that Wayne entered into a label distribution deal with Jay's Rock Nation. It would only be a streaming deal with Tidal for Wayne's upcoming free Weezy album. Wayne would also become the latest artist owner of the streaming service, joining the likes of Rihanna, Nicki Minaj, Usher, and Alicia Keys. New legal documents were surfaced indicating that Lil Wayne was trying to oust Birdman from any involvement with Young Money. Wayne would claim that Birdman has constantly stiffed his artists on their royalty, so much so that he was fearful that his biggest stars, Drake and Nicki Minaj, will walk away from the label altogether whenever their contracts would allow them to. Originally announced back in February of 2015, and referenced heavily by Lil Wayne, his free Weezy album will become available on title July 4th of 2015. The 15-track album would feature appearances from Wiz Khalifa, Young Jeezy, Corey Guns, and more. Weezy would take another shot at Cash Money. Rapping, rest in peace, the Cash Money Weezy, he's gone but not forgotten. The album will receive mixed critical reviews, racking up over 10 million streams in its first week of availability. On July 12th of 2015, it will be rumored that Birdman and his entourage will throw drinks at Lil Wayne during a performance at Club Live. On July 15th of 2015, an indictment will claim Birdman and Young Thug conspired to delete Lil Wayne when his tour bus was hit up in Atlanta. The Cobb County indictment will claim that Birdman and Young Thug conspired for Pee Wee Roscoe to crush Lil Wayne in April. The indictment would also highlight a connection between Roscoe, Thug, and Birdman, including Roscoe's appearance in Young Thug's halftime video. Roscoe's phone records show that he was in contact with Birdman and Young Thug directly before and after Wayne's bus was hit up. 
just one day after the explosive indictment connecting him to the attempted crushing of Wayne, Birdman will bring a $50 million lawsuit against Jay-Z entitled for streaming Wayne's Free Weezy album exclusively. Birdman will claim Cash Money still holds exclusive rights to all of Wayne's music and their title, Streams, are illegal. The lawsuit will point to a portion of Wayne's disputed Cash Money contract which stipulates that he has no right to license his own music. July 28th of 2015, veteran hip-hop journalist and radio personality Andy Martinez will sit down with Birdman for an interview. It will be Birdman's first since the drama with Lil Wayne began. Birdman will speak openly about the love he has for Lil Wayne. Birdman will go on to say that Wayne is my son no matter what. That ain't never gonna change. Stunner would deny having anything to do with Pee Wee Roscoe hitting up Wayne's tour bus, saying, that's the craziest ish I ever heard in my life. Birdman will sidestep any questions about the ongoing legal matters over Wayne's music. Outside of Wayne, Birdman would also claim that Drake and Nicki Minaj are very happy with their current contract and will stay with the label, even if Wayne left. Court documents will later reveal that Pee Wee Roscoe claimed the attempted deletion of LeWayne on his tour bus was the result of Wayne and Birdman's financial dispute. Roscoe would insist that Birdman should be held partially responsible for the incident and was a direct party of the crime. Despite trying to shift the blame onto Birdman and Young Thug, an Atlanta judge would hit Pee Wee with a 10-year prison sentence, followed by 10 years of probation. Roscoe would plead guilty to 6 of the 27 counts against him, all of which were gang-related. The previous indictment would implicate Birdman and LeWayne in the crime as all well-known members of the Bloods. Neither Birdman nor Young Doug were ever formally charged with a crime in the case. The first signs of a potential reconciliation since the beef began over a year ago, both Wayne and Birdman will be seen at Drake's New Year's Eve party. Later reports were emerged claiming that McMahon brokered a peace agreement between the two by setting up a two-hour phone call prior to Drake's party. Wayne, who wasn't willing to drop his lawsuit, will be willing to work together to squash the beef. Just a few months after his entourage threw drinks at Wayne in Club Live, Birdman will give a speech on stage at the very same venue and say that he and Lil Wayne have squashed their beef. Birdman will go on to say, family never dies. This is my MFing son, and I'll ride or die for him. I'm going to live for him, and I'm going to MFing kill for him. That ain't never going to change. YMCMB for life. Birdman will later post a pic of he and Wayne in the studio alongside Yo Gotti. Although Wayne still hadn't dropped the lawsuit, it would seem like the two might reconcile the legal drama any day now. Lil Wayne will go on to file a $40 million lawsuit against Universal Music Group. The lawsuit will be separate from his suit against Cash Money. UMG is Cash Money's parent company. The lawsuit will seek to reclaim some of the profits from the success of Drake, Nicki Minaj, and Tiger. Universal reportedly used most of Wayne's portion of the funds to pay down the debt Birdman had accrued, giving out huge advances at cash money. Although Young Money is a subsidiary of cash money, the Wayne owns 49% of it directly, and the lawsuit would be an attempt to reclaim the portion of the profits. A full year and a half later, the beginning of their beef, Wayne is back to cursing out Cash Money during performances. F the bull and F Cash Money, Wayne would yell at Denver's 420 rally. Reports would surface afterwards claiming he and Birdman are still fighting over the Carter Five and that their attempt at reconciling the lawsuit has failed. All previous settlement talks have apparently been taken off the table and as such, the entire thing will basically be back where it started. During a real 92.3 interview, Birdman would talk about the root of the issues with Wayne, stating that although they are not seeing eye to eye, at the moment it does not like they are enemies. Birdman would also mention that he hasn't talked to Wayne in over a month, but when stuff first popped off between them, they didn't speak for an entire year. Wayne would take to Twitter with a series of tweets indicating he's feeling defeated and hinting that he would retire. Rick Ross would stick his nose into Wayne's and Baby's business by tweeting a quote about trying to get Wheezy onto MMG. Ross would tweet, get Birdman on the phone. A report from TMZ would cite sources close to Birdman saying that LeWayne was in possession of the physical recording of the Carter Five and he had long refused to hand it over to the label. Birdman would claim that Wayne was essentially holding on to the Carter Five for leverage during his ongoing legal battle with cash money. According to the legal documents obtained by TMZ, Weasley would claim that Birdman took a reported $70 million of the label's $100 million advance as part of Universal Music Group's distribution deal, which the pair had agreed to share. Weezy went on to say that Birdman had admitted to taking a lump sum for royalties, marketing, and recording expenses. The judge in Wayne's case would order Birdman to detail 
how exactly the 100 million advance was spent. Reports were circulate that lawyers for each party were close to reaching an agreement. Birdman would allegedly call off the negotiations to settle their 51 million dollar lawsuit after hearing about Weezy shouting out Rockefeller instead of cash money during a performance. July 5th of 2017, Lil Wayne would accuse Cash Money and Universal of preventing him from getting money off of Drake's deal. Lil Wayne would file an amended petition in a New Orleans court, including Birdman, Ronald Slim Williams, as well as Universal Music Group, seeking more than $40 million in actual damages. Wayne would claim that Cash Money was yet to pay him the $8 million advance he's owed for the Carter Five, and is preventing him from receiving any profits he should have made off the success of Young Money Axe, Drake, and Nicki Minaj. Despite his legal battles with Cash Money Records, Lil Wayne would insist he has the power to release the Carter Five whenever he feels like it. During a phone interview with Wild Wayne on New Orleans Q93 radio station, Wayne would say, and I quote, Of course you're going to see the Carter Five. I just don't want to put it out the wrong way. Honestly, I can do what I want at any time. The fans deserve it to be right, and that's how it's going to be. I'm going to make sure it's right. I can drop whatever, whenever I want to drop. That's why I keep dropping whenever or whatever I want to drop. But I'm not going to give them the quarter five the wrong way. Birdman with Al these Flinners on Instagram Live about opinions that people were having about the Wayne and Baby situation. Baby will go off saying, I've been hearing all of you talking about this Lil Wayne ish. Lil Wayne this, Lil Wayne that. Ish, Lil Wayne my son. I raised him. He ain't have nothing. I bought him to be something and got something. You heard me? Y'all don't think I'm gonna make sure he's straight? All y'all can suck a D. I'm gonna show all y'all what's happening and how to stay out of my business. It will be nearly four years of waiting and fighting. Birdman would again promise Weezy's long delayed project will see the light of day very soon, without a doubt. Baby would tell Wrap It Up magazine that the album would be dropping soon and will be well worth the wait. Birdman would also promise that the Carter Five would be the biggest album of 2018. That will put it up against a pretty stacked album roster that year. Cardi B's Invasion of Privacy, Drake, Scorpion, Nicki Minaj, Queen, Post Malone's, Bare Bones, and Bentley's, to name a few. Birdman was rumored to be struggling financially by the end of that year. The Blast will report that Birdman could lose his mansion over a $12 million unpaid loan. Rick Ross would again stick his nose in Baby's business. This seems stunner on Snapchat. Weezy would take another shot at Baby, rapping, No man should have all that power if he can't afford to pay the light bills. He would rap on Bazine, a single off Etika's RGB mixtape. The two former collaborators would appear to reconcile at their beloved Club Live. Birdman would share a photo of him hanging out with Lil Wayne, captioning it, Me and My Son. The Blast would again report the talk between Wayne and Baby would again get heated, as the court would order the label to handle with documents regarding the $51 million lawsuit. Sources will say that after the suit is over, there will be no connection, no ties, and no business relationship. The end of YMCMB was here. Birdman will mostly sidestep questions about his strained relationship with Wayne during interviews. His talks with Beats once Ebro would offer a bit more transparency. Baby will go on to say, we got to get this ish together because it's affecting our kids. That's not cool with me at all. His daughter is my godchild. I love her to death. June 7th of 2018, the Wayne and Birdman will finally reach a settlement. After three years, the $51 million lawsuit will be finally over. Both parties involved will be tight-lipped about the specifics. The Blast will report that Wayne would only walk away with $10 million. Wayne's attorney, Ron Sweeney, would say in a statement, Lil Wayne is his own man, a man that owns his assets, his music, and himself. At some point, Wayne will let his fans know what's going to happen next. In other words, it appears he's finally in control of his destiny. August 26th of 2018, Birdman would apologize to Lil Wayne. The Louisiana Fest would end with a welcome surprise. Birdman would pop up to apologize to Weezy on stage. It feels amazing to be home with my son. I love him to death. Baby will say to the New Orleans audience, I don't know what y'all know, but I know what I know, and I know how I feel about what I know. I knew this day was going to come, but I ain't know when it was going to come. The two will perform big time as classic, still fly. With a lawsuit behind him and an album to drop, Bill Wayne will speak with Billboard about the aftermath of fighting Birdman in the biggest battle of his career, stating, I'm glad that it is finally over. This was the story of Lil Wayne and the Cash Money Birdman Beef.